I want to say how much I appreciate the chance to be with you and how much I've enjoyed the, the time I've been here before. And I'm grateful for uh, the fact that not only do I get to be with you here at uh, this congregation, but also get to be around uh, Adam and Megan and the family. Uh, the faculty at Memphis School of Preaching has such a high regard for this family, this couple, and I'm grateful that you are able to work with them and they with you. It's a, a blessing indeed for me to be able to see them this week and to be around them. And I look forward to getting to know you better and better. I wish that my lovely wife Tish could be with me. Uh, she is a sixth grade school teacher at Hernando Middle School in Mississippi and uh, suffered a fall recently at school. Uh, of all things, somebody had spilled some hand sanitizer <laughs> and it knocked her to her knees and uh, landed on her knees. And uh, so she's not able to get out and about as well right now. But fortunately, uh, she's not hurt, hurt worse than she could have been. Um, turned out to be better than we th than uh, than we thought at first. So grateful that uh, she is okay. Here's a grandfather sitting on the porch reading his Bible. His grandson walks up to him. He says, "Granddaddy, what are you doing?" And his grandfather wisely responded, "Well, I guess you might say." I'm studying for my final exam. And all of us who are in this room understand that someday there will be a final examination. In fact, Romans 14, 12 says, So then each one of us shall give account of himself to God. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of the things we've done in the body, whether they be good or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Now, we just finished taking finals this past Thursday and Friday at the Memphis School of Preaching for the first quarter classes. And of course, every student likes to know before the final is given, what should I study to be prepared for the final? And so when it comes to our final examination of all final examinations, what should you study? Well, here it is, 1,189 chapters 66 books, and 31,102 verses. You say, well, that's a broad amount of material over which to be tested. Can you boil it down a little bit more for us? And the answer is yes. And I think it's very appropriate that the slide on the screen is a picture of a Bible because that is exactly the material over which you and I are going to be tested. We're not going to be tested over the doctrines and commandments of men over a religious tract written by even a brother in Christ, we're going to be tested over the inspired Word of God. In fact, Jesus said, as I alluded to in Bible class, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge men in the last day. John chapter 12 and verse 48. Romans 2 and verse 2 says, the judgment of God is according to truth. And John 17, 17 Thy word is truth. And so here is the standard by which you and I will be judged on the day of judgment. And let me say something to you about the value of a standard. We've seen the value of an absolute standard even during this pandemic because true or false, you've got one medical expert over here that people are claiming is their medical expert and he or she says thus and so. You've got another medical expert over here that someone says is equally an expert or maybe even more an expert than the other individual that claims to be or is purported to be an expert, and they've said something that seems to be different than what this person is saying. And then you've got all these different news outlets giving all these different reports about this, that, and the other. And I don't know about you, but as much as you're reading and seeing and hearing, have you ever just wanted to throw your hands up and say, well, who knows what's what? Because one person says this, and then six weeks later, they say the opposite of this, and then they back to saying what they said at the first, and we can't figure it out. Our heads are spinning. And friends, that's something that uh, shows us the need for absolute standard. 
of what to do in our lives. And let me say this as I get ready to address some questions that will be on your final. I'm grateful to God that He cared enough to supply me with the information over which I'm going to be tested. He didn't just make the world and let me walk outside and look at it and say, wow, someone awesome made this. I wonder if they love me. I wonder if they even know I exist. I wonder if they have anything they want me to do. I wonder if there's anything they don't want me to do. And I'm so grateful for this standard that I have. I don't have to live fumbling and speculating and trying to find my way. I know the narrow way that is mapped out. And the GPS, the gospel plan of salvation, is right here and all I need is contained within this book. And so the most basic questions of life answered in this book right here. Let's take the first one. Where did I come from? Where did man come from? It's such a basic question. When I was a little boy, I'd hear my dad preach on this from time to time. Other preachers preach on it. I have no illusion or desire to say anything different to their profound or new. I want to say the same thing the Bible's always been saying. And when it comes to where did man come from, we really only have a couple of options. Either he was deliberately designed and purposed and given a purpose, or man just happened by accidental chance and happenstance, and we don't really have a purpose for being here. Kaboom, this happened, and here we are, and we don't know what's coming in the future. So just enjoy your life as long as you have life, because when it's over, it's over. What kind of life is that? I'm grateful that I know where I came from. I know where man came from and thus where I came from. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1. Do you know how profound that verse is? The very first verse of the Bible. Some years ago, there was a scientist, and this is back in the late 1700s, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. This man by the name of Spencer came out with this startling discovery. The stuff life is made of can be condensed into five elements. There is time, force, energy, space, and matter. Look at the stuff life is made of, and you'll find it is time, force, energy, space, and matter. And you turn to the very first verse of the Bible, and what do you find? In the beginning, what's that? That's time. In the beginning, God, force, created energy, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. In the very first verse of Scripture, all of those elements are found. And yes, this book was, cre was given by God to you and to me so that we would know how He did what He did. Now, there's not a person in this room that was present when God made the world. But you know, you don't have to have been present somewhere to know that something had to happen that is by design. I was not present when this building was constructed. I was nowhere in the vicinity. I didn't see anyone laying any bricks or hammering any nails. In fact, I wasn't here when the screen behind me was fastened to the wall. And I was not here when the projector above me was pointed at the screen fastened to the wall. But I don't have to have been here to know this happened on purpose. There's a reason the screen is here and not in the back corner of the auditorium. There's a reason the projector is pointing this way and not to the, my left corner of the auditorium. This is done by deliberate design. Someone did this on purpose. And this compared to the complexity of your DNA and mine is, is nothing. I know there's a God in heaven, Daniel 2.28, because of Hebrews 3.4. What does that mean? Every house is builded by some man. Well, who would deny that? This house was built by some man. We all know this. I went to the St. Louis Science Center with an elder in the church years ago, and we went to a visit during the day before going to take in a ball game that night. And while we were there at the St. Louis Science Center, there were all these exhibits talking about uh, 
evolution this and then this happened by millions and millions of years ago this did turned into that and it was really just a lot of uh, human speculation not based on any evidence and so we were looking at all of this and I was getting frustrated we came around a corner and there was a big blank wall and mounted on that wall were like nine maybe nine or ten video monitors and if you looked at the far left monitor and followed it from left to right, you could see the video of them building the St. Louis Science Center. First monitor had the clearing of the land, the bulldozers and the laying of the foundation, the removing of the trees and things of that nature. And then you get to the next monitor. And if you followed it from left all the way to the furthest monitor on the right, you could see the building of the St. Louis Science Center videographed right there for you to see. Now, I've never been one to leave graffiti anywhere, but I wanted to that day. After seeing all these things that I'd seen and then seeing the simplicity of this illustration, I thought about Hebrews 3, 4. For every house is built by some man. Here's your evidence. Look right here, you see? But he that built all things is God. I don't have to have been present at creation to know that as I look at the complexity of the human body, I look at the stars of the heaven, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork, Psalm 19.1. And I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalm 139.13 and following. I know that I had to have a maker. And you know, this is simple stuff. I'm going to be deliberately absurd right now. Young people, do we have any young people in here that like cake? Do you like cake? What's your very favorite cake? I want you to imagine that you come in and you find your very favorite cake on the kitchen counter, frosted with your very favorite frosting, even has your name written on the top of the cake. And you track down mama and you say, Mom, thank you for baking my favorite cake. I love you. And mom says, I love you too, but I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't bake you a cake. Well, it's the one sitting on the kitchen counter. I don't know anything about a cake on the kitchen counter. Show it to me. I can promise you in my family, if my wife said to our children, I didn't bake the cake, they wouldn't come running to me. Daddy, thank you for baking my favorite cake. I would not get that reception because I'm not really good in the kitchen. But some men are. And so your child comes to you and says, Daddy, did you bake me a cake? No. I don't know what you're talking about, huh? Well, there's a cake on the kitchen counter with my name on it. My favorite cake, my favorite frosting, my name. How did it get here? Where did it come from? Your brother and sister, do they love you enough to bake you a cake? Maybe. But no, they didn't do it either. So Dad calls a family meeting. He said, we've got to figure out this mystery. He says, you know what I think happened? I think, I, I think I've got this thing figured out. You know, all of us were away from the house today. And while we were away, there must have started being like a rumbling or a little small earthquake of sorts that shook this house. And as it shook this house, a mixing bowl started working its way toward the edge of the cabinet. And then a particularly violent shake sent the mixing bowl plummeting to and landed on the counter and it landed right side up ready to receive ingredients. But how are we going to get the ingredients in the proper location? At some point there must have been such a violent shaking or quaking that a, a gas pipe or main burst and kaboom! An explosion rocked this house, sent the refrigerator door flying open and eggs flying out. They just started flying out of the refrigerator and of all the places the eggs could have gone in the entire kitchen fortunately for us they smashed on the cabinet right above the mixing bowl and dripped into the mixing bowl but no eggshell got in there somehow all the ingredients necessary for the baking of a cake collided in midair and of all the places they could have landed they landed in the mixing bowl and then the earth's quaking and shaking and mixing the contents of the bowl. But daddy, how did it get from a mixing bowl into a cake pan into the oven? Just bear with me, children. 
Okay, it's in the mixing bowl now. Now we've got to get it in a cake pan. How are we going to get it in a cake pan without any human hands involved? Without any... Ah! Kaboom! There was another explosion. At which time, the cake pan came flying out of its location. The mixing bowl went flying through the air, slammed into the cake pan, and the cake pan landed on the kitchen floor, and the mixing bowl's upside down, emptying its contents into the cake pan, and now we're getting somewhere. Daddy... Cakes don't bake themselves sitting on the kitchen floor with a mixing bowl in the middle of them. How are we going to, children, have you not heard a word I said? Whenever you can't explain how something happened, kaboom, a big explosion explains it all. There, was, there must have been a big bang, at which time the cake pan and the mixing bowl separate. The oven door is thrown open. The, the cake pan is thrown in. Daddy, who turned the oven on? Uh, quaking, shaking. There's a, a mason jar above the oven and its mason jar falls toward the floor. It bumps into the knob to turn it to bake. Another mason jar happens to hit the temperature knob in just such a way as to turn it to the exact temperature needed to bake a cake. <laughs> Daddy, um, who took the cake out of the oven? frosted it when the cake was just, I mean, just right, just as moist as moist can be. Kaboom! There's an explosion. Oven door flies open. Refrigerator door flies open. Here comes the frosting. The top pops off the frosting. The frosting somehow smothers the cake as it collides with it. I'm not sure how it wrote your name on it yet there. I'm still working on that one. But uh, that's how the cake got here, boys and girls. Anyone who can figure out anything can see that. Mama, do you want to call 911 or should one of us kids call 911? Daddy has lost his mind. Is there anyone that's sitting here today and heard me describe that and thought the whole time, sounds reasonable, yes, yes. I think that's exactly how it happened. You realize what you and I want to know who cleaned up the mess, don't you? You and I are being asked to believe that human beings with far more complexity than a cake, the ingredients that go into making a cake, you and I are being asked to believe that kaboom, there was an explosion and this did this and turned into that and kaboom, here we are. And you and I are being told by people with a straight face, that's how it happened. Friends, I am not ashamed to say today that if a cake has to have a baker, man has to have a maker. And he did have one. His name is God. God made, in the beginning, God created. And on the sixth day of creation, he made man. Someone says, okay, but Brother Clark, how are you going to explain the age of the earth? It's been proven by scientists that the earth has multiplied billions and billions of years old. And how has that been proven by the scientists? Well, the fossils show such and such. And how did they prove the fossils were as old as they claimed they were? I'm going to tell you a dirty little secret that uh, they don't want you to know. And they're not going to word it this way, but this is really the truth. This is the truth. When they come to dating the earth, they've come up with this idea that any fossils found in this sediment of the earth would be this old. They've indexed the fossils and said, okay, if you find a fossil, something in this sediment that is this many millions of years old, this sediment would be this many. Okay, now I want to know, how do you know that stuff found in that sediment are that many millions of years old? How do you know that it's that many millions of years old? Not making this up. How do I know that this, anything found in this sediment is millions of years old? I know that by the fossil that's found in it. Wait a minute, I thought you were dating the fossil by where you found it. I am, and, and you're dating where I found it by what? By the fossil. The fossil is this many millions of years old, therefore anything... Th Friends, you're engaged in what we call circular reasoning. If you let me assume this 
then I can, I can make anything up I want to. And again, I'm not making this up, though they would not describe it this way. They would try to be more scientific about it, although true science means to know. And friends, no one was there to say, where did we get cows and where did we get whales? Do you know where whales came from? Where do we get whales? Well, one day there was a cow standing on the shore looking out at the water and wondering what it would be like to live out there instead of here. So the cow wanders out into the water to try to see what it would be like to live there and doesn't make it very long until he drowns. She drowns. Another cow nearby sees this and thinks, I can beat that. I'm more fit to survive than that. That cow wanders out into the water, lasts a little longer than the previous cow, but she dies also. Until finally there's a cow that's fit enough to survive and tread water long enough to survive to develop a breathing mechanism and apparatus. And then that cow gives birth to offspring that will then have this same kind of apparatus and that will just keep living in the water and getting, and then eventually here come the whales. What do you think of that? Friends, you know what I'm going to go with? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's so simple. Someone says, but you haven't explained the age of the earth. Now, I'll tell you what. Here's the explanation. And if Adam doesn't mind, I'll use him as part of this illustration since he happens to share the same name as does the first man in recorded scripture in, in history. Adam and Eve... We see this Adam in the Old Testament. Now, I want to ask you, based on the account given in Genesis, when God made Adam, the first Adam, did He make him as a helpless little baby that needed a mama to nurse him and to raise him and to help him get into his toddler stage and then he can move on into adolescence and then he can become a young adult and then a full-grown man. Is that the way the Bible depicts Adam in Genesis? Is he created as a little baby? On the first day of his existence, he appears as a full-grown man because God made him that way. So I want you to picture this now. Here's the first Adam. Five days after he appeared on the scene, Five days after Adam arrived in this world, how, what did he look like? Five days after God had put him in the world, what did that Adam look like five days after God put him there? And then take your Adam, the preaches for you. I have a grandson named Adam also. Take him as well. Take these Adams. Five days after they came into the world, what did they look like? Do they look like full-grown human beings? No. So wait a minute. How old is the first Adam five days after God made him? Five days old. How old did he look? How old did he appear to be? True or false? Five days after God made the first Adam, he appeared to be much older than any Adam five days old you and I have ever seen. Yes or no? So God built Adam with the appearance of age already built into him. That's right. And so you can tell me the earth is multiplied this many years old. And I'm going to say, well, it may appear to be that old. But actually, God built the appearance of age into the first man. And he built the maturity and appearance of age into the creation itself. And so it's not as old as it looks. Not as old as it looks. And so I believe the Bible about where I came from, where man came from. God created the heavens and the earth. In fact, I don't know if you, this, one of the songs we were singing there had Psalm 33, 8 up as one of the uh, references for its origin. I'd like for you to turn quickly to Psalm 33. This is what I believe. Yes, I believe this about God and His power. Verse 6 of Psalm 33. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. And then verse 8 is the verse that appeared on the screen. 
Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Because of what you can do. You can speak things into existence. Someone says, Brother Clark, you surely don't believe that God spoke the world into existence in six ordinary 24-hour days and rested on the seventh. Surely you don't believe that. I'll tell you what I believe. I don't believe he needed that much time if he'd wanted to do it faster, he could have. Why did God take six days and rest on the seventh? Not because that's what he needed to create a universe. Don't forget God was also creating something else. He was creating time. Because there was no time, is no time where God lives. And so he's creating a world of space and time. And he created a beginning. And he made that creation week seven days. Ask the evolutionists to explain to you where their seven day week comes from. Wait for it. Where did we get our seven day week? What's the scientific origin of a seven day week? Why not a 10 day week? Why not a 14 day week? Where do we get our seven day week? They don't have an answer. I do. You do. In the beginning, God created. And then on the seventh day, he rested. Throughout that seven days, God did it all. That raises the second question for our consideration today. Now that I know where I came from, what am I doing here? Why did God put man on the earth anyway? I want to invite your attention to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we're not supposed to read someone else's diary without their permission, but we have divine permission to read this one. Solomon wrote a diary of sorts. It's inspired. It does contain a listing of the things he tried to do in life to find happiness and fulfillment. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, you'll note that he says in verse number 13, I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things done under heaven. I was determined to find the meaning of life. All right. What did you find, Solomon? Well, I, verse 16, communed with mine own heart. Interesting, the very man who said in Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding is doing the very thing he said not to do. He's leaning to his own understanding. I communed with mine own heart, verse 16. And verse 17, I gave my heart to know. It's all what I feel in my heart. And Solomon chapter 2, 1, what did you say in your heart? I said... My bottom line is enjoy pleasure. I'm going to do whatever is pleasurable. Enjoy pleasure. Solomon, how's that working for you? Behold, this is also vanity, emptiness, grasping for the wind. I've got it. I've got something substantive. You do. Open up your hand and show us what you capture. It's grabbing for the wind. There's nothing there in the stuff of life, in the things of this world. So Solomon says, I, I tried to just enjoy anything pleasurable. Yep, that's what I'm going to do in life. And how'd that work for? I'm, I'm miserable. In fact, look for someone whose bottom line quest is enjoy pleasure. Drop down to verse 17 of Ecclesiastes 2. How, Solomon, what's your conclusion? Therefore, I hated life. So much for pleasure making you happy. Therefore, I hated life. Solomon, what kind of pleasures did you seek? Well, verse 2, I tried to laugh my way through life. Send in the clown, serenade me, entertain me, make me laugh, tickle my funny bone. Okay, Solomon, how'd that? No, that didn't do it. So I tried alcohol. I tried, verse 3, to, I sought in mine heart to give myself the wine. I'll just, I'll just drink wine and titillate the senses that way. Solomon, did that know? So I became a workaholic, verse 4. And I mean, I'm talking great works. I had houses, plural, not a dream house. I had houses. And I built them vineyards and landscaped them beautifully. And uh, verses 4, 5, and 6. And then seven. I had servants and maidens and servants born in my house. Have you ever thought or said out loud, I just wish I had someone 
that could keep up with the cooking and cleaning and let me get some rest. Solomon said, I've got that. Here's what I'd like tonight. Make that for me. Servants, whatever it is, you have to make it. Oh, I want to command performance of my singers. Bring in the singers. And verse number 7 says he, he had servants and maidens and then great possessions of great and small cattle above all in Jerusalem before me. Silver and gold, men singers, women singers. I was great. I increased more than all that were in Jerusalem before me. No one had been as wealthy as I or as wise as I. Verse 10, Solomon, how rich were you? Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. If I wanted it, I saw it, I bought it. I asked this question one time preaching a similar sermon. I said, if you could get to the point where you had so much money, you could buy anything you wanted the moment you wanted it, would you truly be happy? And I tell you, children will tell you what they're thinking sometimes when mom and dad don't want them to. When I ask that question, would you truly be happy if you could buy anything you wanted the moment you wanted it? And a little voice from the auditorium said, uh-huh. Yes, oh. How many times have we had to say at Walmart, no, can't afford that, no, no, no. What if you could buy every toy your child ever wanted or dreamed of? Wouldn't they be the happiest child? You know as well as I do what happens when they get the toy they've got to have and two hours later they're playing with a box and the, they don't even know where the toy is anymore. You've seen how fickle we are about, oh, if I just had this, I'd really be happy. I preached in South Haven, Mississippi, five miles from Graceland Mansion where Elvis Presley lived. And one particular Sunday morning, this couple came to our services, and I'd never met them before, and so on Tuesday night after that Sunday service, I went to their home. I just wanted to thank them for coming and invite them back. When I got to the door and rang it, they saw me and were so enthusiastic. Come on in, preacher. So glad you came by. And I told a story Sunday morning in my sermon about Elvis Presley, and it goes like this. It, a magazine reporter was at Elvis's house, the mansion, Graceland, and Elvis, he was there to write a puff piece about how great it would be to be Elvis Presley. Can you imagine being Elvis and having all these beautiful women think you're so handsome and you, you have all this money and wealth and your platinum and gold records on the wall, your in-ground pool, your limousine to whisk you away to your private jet so you can fly anywhere in the world. Oh, what a life. Whoa, if I could just be Elvis. And during that interview that was intended to glamorize his life, he said, sometimes I believe I'm the most miserable man on earth. And the reporter's like, come on, come on, Elvis, come on, come on. You, you, you're miserable. Yeah, huh? yeah. He wouldn't take it back. So that Tuesday night, I go to this couple's house and the man brings up the interview that I referenced in my sermon. He says, you really took me down memory lane Sunday. I said, how is that? He said, that interview you were talking about with Elvis? He said, I was in the room when they conducted that interview. Now, I'd never met this couple, so you'll have to pardon me. But when they're telling me they were sitting in the room with Elvis when he gave this interview, I'm thinking, oh boy. What kind of Looney Tunes have I run into here that bless their hearts? I think they were with Elvis at his interview. And then she spoke up. She said, Gene here is Elvis's first cousin. His mother and Elvis's mother were sisters. I married Gene, married into the family. We used to live at Graceland. They got the photo albums out to prove it. Showed me all these pictures. And he said... You told it right when you said that Elvis said he was the most miserable man on earth, but you do not know just how befuddled that made that reporter who was like, well, I'm here to try to make everyone want to be you, and you're telling me it's not all it's cracked up to be? Friends, I could have saved Elvis Presley and name any Hollywood celebrity you've seen on true Hollywood stories. 
that's wrecked their life, ruined their lives with drugs or whatever, I could save all of them and save you and me a lot of heartache and trouble if we just read Solomon's inspired diary about why we're here. It's not to get stuff and to get famous and to finally just accumulate as much stuff as I want because you know what? We get so much stuff and then we think, I can't fit it in my house anymore. Where am I going to put this extra stuff? I'll get me a storage facility and put it there. And so I, I put it in. The, friends, I'm going to ask you a question. What's going to happen to all of that stuff, whether it's in your house or in that storage facility? What's going to happen to all that stuff when you die? How much of it are you taking with you? You're not. So even if COVID-19 is not the thing that, that gets me, something is going to someday, and I'm going to someday die. And I don't know what's going to be the cause. But I do know this. I'm not taking it with me. I, I asked this question because I'd read it somewhere, and it always stuck with me. It said, have you ever seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul? All the possessions in it. And then one day I saw one that belonged to a funeral home that was transporting things from, but it wasn't the person that had died whose stuff was being transported to the grave site with them. And even if they did say, put my stuff in the grave with me, tell me what good that does. I did a funeral in which the family filed by the deceased for the last time and every one of them put two brand new $1 bills in that casket. They closed the lid with all that money in there, and it's still there to this day, I guarantee you. It hasn't been spent in eternity. Well, why would the family do this? This loved one, when he was in the hospital, would always say, now you're not spending the night here and sleeping in that chair in all uncomfortable positions. You're going home. And when you come back in the morning, then indeed, you know, I'll see you then. But what if they let me out before you get back here? You check my sock and you put $2 bills in there. Enough money to buy a cup of coffee and a newspaper. That shows you how long ago this was too, doesn't it? Check my sock before you leave. Do I have my two? Yep, you got your two. All right, see you. Have a good night's rest. See you tomorrow. So remembering this about their loved one, every single one of them put the money in the casket, closed the lid. I know some of you are thinking, I'll write a check for the same amount and take the money with me. He can just cash the check, right? Friend, someday the most important thing to you is not going to be the house you live in, the car you drive, the money in your bank account, the clothes you wear. Solomon, can you help us figure out what we're really doing? Yeah, I figure. I finally see it. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Here it is. The conclusion. Oh, that's the people's favorite word to hear the preacher say. Conclusion. Let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Ready? Fear God. Keep His commandments. That's the whole of man. The word duty is italicized, supplied by the translators. But you do no violence to the passage and maybe make it even clearer when you just read it like this. Fear God and keep His commandments for this is the whole of man. What am I doing here? I am here to fear God and keep His commandments. That's the, and that leads me to the last point. Where am I going? And I don't mean for lunch and I don't mean tomorrow. I mean in the end. When my life has ended or this world has come to an end, where will I be then? Where will I be when I get where I'm going? The other night as I drove here last night, I put the GPS in, the address where I was staying, put it in, followed the directions. I didn't know. It was dark. I couldn't see, but I just followed the steps. Okay, someone's mapped this out for me. And so I was able to get from where I was to where I was headed by following the steps. Listen, God has given us the steps to get from here to glory where He is. He is, even when we feel like we're in the dark, we know how to get there because the light of the world has 
mapped out the way for us. He has given us the steps to finding Him and living with Him. And here's the bottom line. If I want to go to where God is, I've got to go the directions He gave me, not my own willful way. And I'll tell you this, there are folks out there that are, are, are going to end up in a place they, they don't want to be. That's hell. It's real. I'm so glad you're still having a gospel meeting even in the midst of a pandemic. And let me tell you one reason why. We've got more people in some ways thinking about their mortality now than ever before. They're suddenly aware of the fact, hey, I'm not bulletproof to the point where I'm completely unable to get sick and seriously ill. And even though fortunately 99 point what percent are recovering and doing okay and we don't want to fear monger, Let's be realistic enough to say there are folks in this room who know someone who knows someone who's had or maybe someone that's dear to you has I've not been briefed. I don't know what you faced here, but I do, I do know this. People are thinking about what happens after this life more now than they were in February. And so let's take advantage of that and let's have a conversation. I'm going to die and I'm either going to heaven or I'm going to hell. That's it. There are no other options. I want to go to heaven. And I can. I just need to follow the instructions. I close with this. Some years ago I was holding a meeting in Kentucky and got on the internet the night before and was looking up the directions to the church building. And the website said, here's how you get there. And then I double checked it. I thought, you know, sometimes people give bad directions accidentally, so let me double check these. And I did, and they said the same thing. For good measure, I typed in one more site on my computer and then punched it into my little portable GPS in my car. They all said the same thing about how to get where I was going. And so I leave the hotel room that morning completely confident that I'm going to go and reach my destination and I reach, I hear the sound, you've reached your destination. And there's nothing but a clump of trees there. And I'm looking beyond the trees, hoping, is there a church building back there, hopefully? No. I'm driving around in vain, looking for a church building. My phone rings. I wasn't smart enough to take a phone number with me, but my phone finally rang. Brother Clark? Yes. Are you okay? No. Uh, I'm lost. Well, where are you? Well, I just passed a sign that said such and such a state park. Oh, Brother Clark, you're 35 miles from us. 35 miles. I'm supposed to make a turn and go 17 miles, and then it'd be one mile the further. But when, you, when your GPS tells you to turn the wrong way and you go 17 miles the wrong direction, you've got to come back that 17 and then go the more 17. He said, we'll just sing till you get here. I was embarrassed that day. But you know what? I don't for one minute think Google and MapQuest and Rand McNally and TomTom Tom got together in a room somewhere and said, let's get B.J. Clark. Let's give him deliberately bad directions so that it really messes him up. They don't know me from Adam. I want to ask you a question. Is it possible to believe directions you've been given and sincerely think they're true the whole time only to find at the end, oh no, I've been misled. Is that possible, yes or no? So I'm asking you as this meeting unfolds, we're going to be giving some very fundamental sermons starting tonight and, and then just going through the rest of, of the week and the kind that will help show people how to get to heaven. Maybe it will help you. Maybe you've got a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, a loved one that you know is thinking about their mortality and, and life beyond this life and what to do to be prepared for that life. This is a perfect time this week to bring those folks here to check the GPS for proper directions knowing this will never tell you to turn into a cornfield instead of a driveway. This has the answers and it never needs to be updated. The answers are still this. You believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? John 8, 24 says, if you don't, you'll die in your sins. Are you willing to repent of your sins? 
All men everywhere must, Acts 17, 30, and the goodness of God ought to make you want to, Romans 2, 4. Will you confess that you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, as the eunuch did in Acts 8, and as you must do unto salvation, Romans 10, 9, and 10? And will you then, as a penitent confessing believer, be buried with your Lord in baptism? Just for an instant, the old man is put underneath, a new man comes emerging from the water, and you are brand new in Jesus Christ. Sins washed away, a member of the church of Jesus Christ, Acts, the book of Acts teaches. And so we ask you, you say, oh, I've already done that preacher. I've, okay, are you, still, are you still headed in the right direction or have you gotten off the narrow way and you took an exit and you're on the broad way again? I'm begging you without apology. I know what time it is. I'm begging you, come make this right. Get ready if you're not. As together we stand and sing, won't you please? <laughs>